Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Bowman, Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, and I want to welcome you to this presentation on Optimize Your Logistics Pinch Points to Build a Risk-Resilient and Sustainable Supply Chain, presented by SAP. Quick reminder, there will be an audience question and answer session at the end of this presentation. Audience members are encouraged to submit their questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Now, the last few years have brought an onslaught of disruption that has transformed the way we think about supply chains, especially when it comes to risk. Alleviating risk is no longer enough, however. Your supply chain must be flexible and resilient enough to withstand whatever challenges come down the line. But where should you start? You need a holistic approach that connects every process, contextualizes every decision, and boosts collaboration with your ecosystem. So today, we're going to explore how to optimize logistics operations with sustainability and resilience in mind by leveraging the power of connected data. We'll also learn from SAP customers about how they have partnered with SAP to build risk-resilient and sustainable supply chains. With that, I want to introduce our speakers for today. Bill King is Director of Digital Logistics Solutions Management with SAP where he focuses on SAP transportation management. He's responsible for global strategy, thought leadership, and go-to-market activities. Bill has spent over 20 years delivering solutions that support both international and domestic transportation operations. Bill has held leadership positions in product management, solutions management, and consulting during his logistics career. Prior to working at SAP, he was the product director for the Manugistics TMS at JDA. Paul Sladovnik is practice lead with Westernocker. Paul has over a decade of supply chain experience spanning multiple industries and areas. He's been involved in the end-to-end -end supply chain process from planning to merchandising and procurement, inbound and outbound logistics, and production. He's acted as a solution architect for building and designing SAP solutions for multiple customers, including Stamil. And Brendan Manderley is carrier relations manager with Stamil. Brendan joined the company in 2006 as a forklift driver at Stamil's old station shipping department. In 2019, he took on the role of transportation specialist, where he ran the outbound transportation department while continuing to work as a sales assistant. In his current role, Brendan fosters Stamil's relationships with carrier partners and works to secure new vendors to help Stamil deliver world-famous fruit to all of its customers. In the fall of 2021, Brendan assisted in the selection of a new transportation management solution and landed on SAP TM. So with that, I want to turn over the presentation to Bill King. Bill, take it away. Start off, just give you a little bit of background about SAP, a little bit what our vision is. Okay, you know, hopefully you're familiar with us. We're a global solution provider focusing on enterprise and digital supply chain solutions. Uh, and what our vision is, is really we want to make every organization in every industry become a network of intelligent, sustainable enterprises. What does that mean? It basically means we want to help folks be agile, be able to make decisions on a real time when they need to with all the options, you know, and be resilient. Um, we'll talk about that a lot today. You know, and when I say resilient, it means flexible. OK, have the options you need when problems arise. OK, and then finally, also do all of this but be sustainable. And I mean, sustainable within your own operation, but then also how that affects your upstream and downstream processes, both your suppliers and your customers, all right? So it's not just uh, sustainable for you, but sustainable across the entire process, all right? At SAP, oh, sorry. Um, you know, what we've seen over the past couple of years is there's been a, somewhat of a new reality in logistics, okay? Um, and what do I mean by that? You know, we talked about resilience um, and, and I mentioned before, what is resilience? It's being flexible, okay? Or being, having the ability to be flexible. Um, a couple of years ago, General Mills uh, participated in a similar session with us um, where they talked about the flexibility where when COVID hit, uh, they needed the flexibility to basically shift their business from, you know, the, the mix they had at the time between institutional um, and retail customers and not have to put together a full scale project because by the way, they were trying to deal with COVID. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about is having that flexibility already in place, okay? 
And then we talk about efficiency and logistics 4.0. What we talk about he, talking about here is basically, you know, making sure my, you know, my process across the logistics process is, you know, works together. Okay. Inner, you know, inner works together. Okay. It doesn't make sense to optimize a sub part of that, like warehousing, if that's just going to make this like, you know, having a great warehouse plan uh, isn't great. If that means you're either having to expedite from a transportation perspective, or you're having trucks stacked up in your yard. Okay. And then from a supply chain integrity and transparent transparency perspective, this is making sure I get have the information, you know, within logistics available to other parts of the organization, other parts of the process, other stakeholders, when and where they need it. Okay. So whether that's sales, procurement, uh, accounting, you know, what have you. Okay. And then a delightful delivery experience uh, is really this is okay. You know, how am I making sure I'm getting stuff to the right place? To the at the you know at the right time for the right cost, whether you're using third party or your own fleet, okay. And then for fi finally, sustainability. Um, you, we talk about that a lot, and we'll probably talk about it again later today. Um, excuse me, but you know this is basically you know, I, I I talk about it from a logistics perspective. Um, you know, those of us who have worked in logistics, and as Bob said, I've been in, in transportation for over 20 years, uh, probably closer to 25. I, I jokingly say, you know, you know, sustainability is kind of the hip new thing now. Um, we were hip before hip. We realized it before we realized it, but we were doing it because it just made good business sense. Um, but now we're needing to take that sustainability view and not just look at, from a logistics perspective, but also share that you know, sustainability efforts and benefits to other parts of the organization that may be tracking it, not just from a logistics, but from a corporate wide perspective. Um, so it's again, it's it's broadening our perspective. So those are just some of the new realities we're seeing. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over or, you know, Paul, if you wanted to go uh, over your slide. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly share who is Westernocker. You know, we might not be as known of a name as SAP, but we've been around for over 50 years, entirely employee owned. I like to call out that we're carbon neutral because as of 2021, we did go carbon neutral. And uh, again, as it relates to logistics, we continue to receive the Diamond Initiative Award from SAP because we like to innovate in this space. Um, logistics for us looks at everything from, you know, the moment we're forecasting a demand plan to that being put into action through the production to actual execution in the warehouse, the yard, the transportation solution, all the way to ultimately uh, figuring out your finances back in ECC. And Brendan? Yeah, uh, here at Stemelt Growers, we're a, a small independent uh, tree fruit growing, packing, uh, shipping, marketing company based out of Wenatchee, Washington. Uh, been around since 1964. Uh, mostly apples, pears. Uh, we're the largest grower of uh, fresh cherries in the U.S. Um, and deliver to, you know, big name customers that everybody would recognize all across the U.S. Brendan, do you want to go through the next slide? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, you know, we're a vertically integrated company. Um, got our start here in Wenatchee. We have, uh, you know, facilities in California. Um, as well as uh, kind of all over the state of Washington, owned and operated by the Madison, Matheson Company since being founded in 1964. Um, and, you know, our mission is to cultivate people and delight consumers through excellence and delivering um, delivering back to the land as well. So. I, I got to say, I probably have consumed a, a fair amount of your product uh, just over this past year myself. So um, <laughs> and with that, let me hand it back to you, Bob. Yeah, it is a great company. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, time now for the panel discussion portion of our presentation in which I get to ask some tough questions of our panel of experts. Let me start with this one. What are the biggest changes that you have seen in the logistics industry in the past few years? I'm going to start with Paul on this one. Yeah, so I'd have to say there's a lot more cross-functional involvement. It's something that SAP has been enabling for quite some time as they have quite the suite of products that enable that. But I mean, with looking at the labor crunch, for instance, the, the need for more real-time collaboration and communication and the drive to just have a single source of truth around data management and analytics, 
have been coming up more and more frequently in conversations with customers, um, whether it's at the boots on the ground level in the factory or even at the C-suite level, those themes always remain the same. Um, I mean, in practice, what that looks like is solutions and roles of individuals using the system are evolving. I mean, a fantastic example of this is Bill mentioned the business network earlier. Um, within there, it's not just carriers going in to do transportation related objects like tendering and invoicing. It's also engaging with the yard, engaging with the warehouse and getting the whole you know, logistics suite involved there through dock appointment scheduling and yard management. Um, and on the flip side, those teams uh, within you as the customer are able to actually see what the schedule looks like for the week and have that real-time collaboration. So it's not just siloed anymore, but it's busting through those silos and roles are evolving to fit it. Thank you. Brendan, what have you seen in the last few years, big changes in logistics? Some of the biggest changes we have seen is just how much supply and demand pictures have changed in such short periods. There's a higher expectation from receivers as well for on-time delivery and an increased shift in customers asking for uh, us to deliver products versus them, you know, having their own transportation solution um, just, you know, helps helps them make sure that we're delivering uh, our best products to them um, as well as, you know, they're not having to deal with that leg of, of their own logistics stuff. And we're, you know, we're managing it already for, um, ourselves as well as other customers. So it's just one more thing off their plate. The very nature of your business means that you're no stranger to the need for the excellent logistics, especially a product where we want to re uh, depends on freshness, depends on dependability. Yeah. So I can really see how that could be important. Bill, what do you think? Big changes. Um, for me, I'd say there's, there's probably three. Um, the biggest one is visibility uh, finally catching on. Um, it's one of those things, again, I've been in the space for a long time. We've been using the word visibility for a very long time. Um, but I think when, with COVID, it, it was starting to happen before COVID, but COVID really reinforced it where folks needed to see it. Part of it's because, you know, the, the supply shortages uh, or capacity shortages um, in terms of, uh, you know, transportation capacity. But basically, you know, it finally catching on and really, you know, getting, you know, um, you know, folks adopting it, okay, and it becoming something that folks are really embracing. Um, and another one would be, you know, sustainability efforts. As I said, it's become something, you know, transportation folks have worked on for a long time. What, you know, for us, it just made sense, you know, how do I consolidate better so I have fewer trucks on the road or fewer containers or fewer rail cars, um, or, you know, from a better routing and optimization, because it just made sense to drive fewer miles, which then meant you know, less gas consumed. Um, but now it's, you know, other parts of the organization, um, you know, it's, and it's being able to not just do what we've done, always done, um, but also be able to report on it and share that with other parts of the organization, because it's, you're seeing it more and more, uh, you know, with a lot of companies, you know, a lot of times coming from the top down, you know, like you folks have said, like Paul just said, they're, they're carbon neutral. Folks are actually measuring it. Um, and they're, they're not alone. A lot of folks are doing that. So it's basically, you know, it, it's not just a buzzword anymore. It's actually becoming a reality. Um, and then probably the third thing that I've seen, um, and we'll touch on this later, I'm, assume, I'm guessing, I'd uh, love to hear uh, Brendan's thoughts on it, is, you know, pre-COVID, you know, spot markets were, you know, a small part of the transportation market. Um, and during COVID, a lot of folks had to move to the spot market a lot more uh, just because of the reality of the shortage of, of uh, transportation resources. And at least what I'm seeing um, now that we're out of COVID is, you know, and not what, you know, completely out of it, but um, the, the shift hasn't gone completely back. Like you know, it hasn't swung completely back the other way. A lot of folks are still using uh, spot markets for a little bit more. I'm not saying it's, it's replacing contracts, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's not the smaller percentage it was pre-COVID. It's, it's maintaining a higher percentage than what it was before. Well, the ups and downs, the unpredictability just make it so difficult. You scramble the spot, spot market to fill in your last minute gaps and to, there's all kinds of reasons for it. You know, it's interesting. I'm very interested in this idea of uh, unanticipated consequences or unexpected consequences. Now, COVID itself was a, was a surprise of all, for all of us. But I'm wondering, in the wake of the pandemic, are there any of these changes that you guys are describing to me today that actually surprised you in any way? Brendan? 
I'm not sure I would say there's a whole lot of surprise there. There's, you know, with the higher on-time delivery expectations, those seem to become forthcoming already. But it definitely felt like some of those changes were accelerated in the wake of the pandemic, kind of speaking back to what Bill said, where some of those shifts already seem to be taking place. They were just moving a lot slower with the pandemic coming on. Uh, a lot of those changes that seemed inevitable already just came into, you know, uh, more focus and, you know, coming becoming more of a reality a lot quicker. Paul, anything catch you by surprise? Yeah, I mean, it, it, one of the things I was thinking about was exactly what Bill called out. It used to be the spot market is reserved for when your standard carriers can't do it. But now it's seeming like more and more customers are leaning to to the spot market for certain lanes. Um, I think another big one is just this continued scarcity of talent, whether it's with drivers, supply chain professionals, manufacturing experts, you name it. it it's had a pretty undeniable impact and caused companies to continue that investment in automation and digitalization. And that seems to be driving a lot of when we get involved nowadays. Yeah, track with what you're seeing, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I kind of stole my own thunder. You know, it, it's, you know, this yeah. in terms of spot markets, you know, saying how they've 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 maintained or or kept some uh, some weight more than we expected. Uh, and then also, in, in some ways, the 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 rate at which sustainability has become such a critical uh, topic for a lot of folks. You know, it, it, it seemed like it was simmering for a while and suddenly it's starting to boil up, if you will. Yeah. One of the, if not the only silver lining of crises, such as we've seen in the last few years, is that they always are accompanied by innovation. And I'm wondering, the three of you, what innovations in logistics do you think hold the most promise in the industry in the wake of the experiences that we've had in the last few years and what we're looking at coming up? Paul? Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest ones that we continue to see even over the last couple of years is just the growing number of partner technologies that help enable that better decision making, whether it's through automated inputs, through visibility of options for the team involved in the actual process. Um, just some examples might be if you look at your geographical information providers um, or routing providers, they might not just be mapping here's the best route or here's here's the best route based on historical traffic patterns. To Bill's point around sustainability, now they might consider elevation changes and be proposing, you know, the best carbon path forward to take. Um, I, I see a lot more of these topics playing out in the sustainability space, the procurement space, and especially the supply chain network space. Mm -hmm. Brendan, what do you think? Innovation. I, I, have a few, I have a few of these. And, um, you know, some of the best innovations that I see is the advancement of real-time transportation visibility. Um, Bill spoke to that very briefly earlier. And, you know, it lends itself and out of the higher on-time delivery expectations that receivers have on suppliers nowadays and you know gives gives in those situ you know gives the the receivers in those situations as much advance notice if there's any kind of delay so that they can shift and you know source product from elsewhere to cover a short period of time if they need it you know if you're going to be a day late maybe um, you know they they might need product to cover an extra day and, and you know they're going to have to go source that from somewhere else just to cover themselves in the meantime uh, some of the other ones, you know, they're going to they're on some some questions further down, so I won't get too deep into them. But just, you know, uh, AI uh, and driver. Well, we get to that in a moment. We get to that in a moment. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in, interesting. OK, okay uh, Bill, do you have a, a, a take on that? I mean, uh, interesting how innovations arise out of crises, is it not? What are we seeing? Yeah. And I, I, I think just piggybacking on what uh, Paul and, and Brendan both said is like, you know, the, the partner solutions, whether it be visibility providers or uh, risk uh, analysis or risk data providers, you know, so it's, it's folks that, you know, really have, you know, and, and the ease with which we can now connect to them. You know, that's one of the other things is, you know, they, they may have been there already pre-crisis, uh, but it's now easier to connect with them uh, and get that data and then also share that data uh, across, you know, the, the ecosystem. Um, hmm. It was, there was a study years ago talking about how transportation or logistics has information that like, you know, I think it was like eight or so other parts of an organization hmm. need. Making, it's, it's a lot easier to get that information now in terms of real-time visibility and then sharing it with other, other parts or other stakeholders. 
dream of decades, you know, real real time visibility. We've been talking about that for so long, and maybe it just did take these these uh, recent events in order to make that a, an actual uh, reality. Uh, okay, here comes. Here's the question uh, about it's on everyone's minds these days. AI, artificial intelligence, ladies and gentlemen, you're actually are looking at four human beings here. We're not generated by AI, but we're going to talk about AI now. And I'm going to ask you guys where you see AI playing a significant role in logistics. And if so, in what way? Paul? Yeah, with, with proper parameters in place, absolutely. Um, I think there's a lot of moving pieces in a true end-to-end -end supply chain, whether it's forecasting the proper demand, purchasing the correct raw materials, maybe even adjusting a formula of the end product based on pricing of those materials and availability, procuring freight, planning efficient production runs, calculating safety stock, et cetera. The list just goes on and on. I think one of the big advantages of where AI can really play a role here would be leveraging the inputs from all these areas and be able to produce tactical and strategic plans. So what if I run my planning forecast for the next three months and my solution gives me a PDF of, you know, what formulas should be built based on my most recent pricing of raw materials. It gives my procurement team a list of what to buy to meet that demand. My logistics team now has a lane level breakdown of what freight they have to go procure and continuing down the road all the way to manufacturing for production runs and safety stock. I see it being a really good enabler, maybe not truly making those decisions as there's still a lot of human inputs that go into that um, and variability, but I see it being a very good enabler for a foundational report. Brendan, AI in your world, what do you think Logist in terms of logistics? Yeah, I mean, data is huge now, right? I mean, so um, being able to leverage some sort of AI model to um, take that data that's being input and and produce the right outputs for everybody that needs it, you know, regardless of where that data is coming from. Um, just looking at a supply standpoint, we're using some AI technology right now. Um, and it goes across, you know, basically all of our products, but just to take an example, you know, if I take a, uh, you know, when we're receiving in Fuji apples uh, from, from a grower to our facility, uh, we used to rely heavily just on, you know, what, uh, you know, a fieldman, you know, somebody who goes out and inspects the orchards, uh, kind of gut feel on what the size was going to be. Uh, now we have a, a program where we take pictures of the bins as they come into the warehouse and it, it uh, individualizes every apple that's in that bin uh, that the picture can see and determines what the average size is. So it's a, it's a huge leap forward in what we can do uh, with, with emerging technologies and being able to better plan around what we expect to have and, um, you know, ultimately you can use that to sell uh, that product to your customers in a better way. And then obviously, you know, that yeah. just runs through the whole supply chain. You can better plan around uh, what packages you're going to need to have, everything. So um, it's it's huge. It's critical. And then, you know, just looking at transportation, knowing where the pitch points are, um, you know, in your entire supply chain, uh, not only on the inbound side, but even on the outbound side and looking across the country, it's, you know, you're delivering products to, um, you know, several different states, what, um, you know, what's coming back from those places to say, you know, where is, where is the, um, you know, where's the supply chain uh, going to be in December coming out of Florida and, you know, using technology to know that, you know, uh, looking, looking forward at uh, any weather patterns that may have uh, disrupted any of their crops that they have coming back out and being able to use that data. Uh, it, it's, it's a big thing. Yeah. And although, as Paul says, let's hope there's still room for the gut in there somewhere. Uh, so AI, in your view, the role of uh, logistics going forward. Yeah, I definitely see there being a place and, and, and Paul brings up a good point, making sure there's, there's controls in place, obviously. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, we're already seeing it in some places where it's being used. I think, you know, Paul might have touched on this in terms of, uh, like, I've seen it where folks are using it for better predicting ETAs, uh, going back to visibility, um, or um, basically, we're already working on a use case um, within SAP, within our logistics space, uh, around improving uh, intelligent goods receipt. So basically, being able to take a stack of papers and scan, not just take an OCR of it, but basically pull from that uh, and pull the, the relevant data 
uh, and be able to create a, a, a record, a digital record to receive against in cases where, you know, you might not have gotten the ASN because, uh, you know, sometimes that you don't get them. Uh, and so basically when the truck arrives, you know, you, you have nothing to receive against. You have nothing to, to, to check when you do the gate check in. Um, to basically, you know, have a, a, a system where you know, it facilitates the process instead of just taking a, a scan and then having to key things in manually, but use Gen AI, generative AI, to pull the specific data to create those records um, that you can then, you know, facilitate that process. And it just, you know, from a labor savings, it, it's pretty significant uh, in terms of, you know, maybe an hour to go through a stack of uh, papers um, to only a few minutes. Okay, so then there's mm -hmm. the benefit. From a labor savings, there's a benefit from uh, congestion at your on your dock or in your yard, and then potentially even the the benefit of you know what if you're a real time uh, manufacturing and you might have had a, a, a you know a, a wind down because the truck was stuck in the middle of the yard. Um, and then there's other you know examples like language based queries, uh, just basically say okay you know what prompted this change. Uh, on this on this load, okay, uh, who made it, why, you know, and be able to just do a quick, uh, quick and uh, dirty search, or I think, Paul, you touched on it a little bit in terms of optimization, you know, how do I run my optimization, different ways to run the optimization, um, so there's, there's a number of things, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, this is kind of off the top of the head, um, these are yeah. some of the ways you could use it, so. And this is an amazing how fast it's come upon us too. After years, decades of talk about AI, all of a sudden it's here and making a huge difference. Of course, the other big word we can't escape, and it's already been mentioned here today, and that is sustainability. We heard a little bit uh, from Brandon about your own uh, net zero uh, aspirations and, and accomplishments, which is great. But I'd like to ask how this recently increased focus on sustainability, you know, we have an environmental, we have uh, uh, social, we have governance, but it's a huge deal now. How has that impacted your business? Paul, give us a perspective. Yeah, so uh, I guess pre, pre pandemic, it was much less of a conversation that popped up whenever we were talking to customers. Now, whenever we go on site, they're wanting to hear about how, how can this tie back to the green line, my green ledger. You know, it starts at the top down in terms of reporting so that your supply chain executives can see what the various activities are contributing to that, you know, carbon emission tracking by location, by, you know, carrier mode of transport. But it also starts at the bottom up so that during that decision making process, you can decide, you know, do I have enough lead time that I can, you know, uh, take the more sustainable path forward? Or does this have to go via air freight or via a, you know, a more impactful to your green line path. So it's just about giving the options both at the top down for visibility and from the bottom up for that day-to-day -day decision making. Bill, how is sustainability becoming a part of TM solutions, maybe in a way that it wasn't before? Um, a couple of different ways. Um, one, it's it's letting other parts of the organization, you know, a lot of times folks will say, well, what, is, what can TM or transportation do from a sustainability perspective? And, you know, it's making them aware of what does transportation do uh, in terms of, as I mentioned already, um, some parts of the organization not re may not realize that, you know, they may think of just, oh, you're just moving a box from A to B. That's it, you know, um, and then you're making them aware of, okay, no, we're actually doing consolidation. So we're reducing the number of trucks on the road, we're reducing the number of rail cars that are being moved or number of containers that are being moved. Um, or if you're doing you know, routing and scheduling, I'm minimizing you know, those miles driven. So there's a direct impact to you know, uh, miles driven, gas uh, consumed and greenhouse gas uh, uh, you know, generated. Um, so I think there's, there's that perspective. Um, and then it's also you know, from a transportation perspective is there's more visibility to not just that, but then, okay, how do we make sure we share that information with other parts of the organization? You know, so we've been kind of doing this in our own little world uh, for a number of years, uh, like you said. Um, now we need to make sure we share that and, and broadcast it to the rest of the organization uh, or the rest mm -hmm. of the ecosystem. Yeah. Interesting how the whole concept of real-time visibility, which you were talking about earlier, dovetails so nicely with that of sustainability because the need for reporting that kind of data just comes, it's sort of like a comes with a package in, in a way, in an interesting way. Okay, so AI important, but not the only technology that's affecting logistics and transportation these days. What about automation in general? How do you guys see automation impacting your logistics operations from a broad scale? 
Brandon, what are you seeing in your company? At Stemote here, you know, with uh, just the just the implementation of SAP TM, we've been able to automate several of our processes that save hours of work every day. Um, you know, a lot of our, uh, you know, most of our, our uh, logistics oper well, transportation operations, uh, really specifically, were just emails to different carriers that we knew um, on an individual level for every load that we had, every order that we were trying to, you know, get from point A to point B or point C, um, all went through email uh, one at a time. And, you know, with the implementation of SAP TM, we have now, you know, a central hub where everything is and we can see everything in real time. We've been able to automate a ton of those processes um, so that if we have something that's, you know, a pretty programmable uh, lane, uh, we have, you know, carriers that run those lanes consistently and everything is automated. You know, it, 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 there's a, a lead time that's set and as soon as that order comes in, it goes out to a carrier, it gets accepted, it gets awarded without anybody ever even have to touch it. Um, it's, it's so much time savings. Um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's huge on our side. And then, you know, in, even with our spot market type tenders, where we don't have some consistency, um, instead of sending out an email to a carrier and, and, you know, waiting for a response, you know, whether it's positive or negative, and then, you know, having to send back out to another carrier, you know, um, we can send those out, uh, they're all, all at the same time, all to the same carriers. We get all the responses back in, in real time and can, you know, review everything in one spot in real time just to be able to, um, you know, select the carrier that best fits based on price and um, service yeah. level. There were certainly the logistics operations years ago asked what they're doing on the digital side. They say, we are totally digital. We use email. So yeah. That was probably the digitization of, of, of way back then. Paul, what do you think about this whole idea of automation in general impacting logistics? Yeah, yeah. I mean, management by exception is a golden rule when it comes to logistics within SAP. Um, I mean, uh, every, everything that Brendan just mentioned, uh, that that's what, what our customers typically see is they're saving hours per day. Um, but it doesn't really mean that they they can just sit around and twiddle their thumbs. There's all sorts of kind of evolving of those roles. So instead of being the one that sits there and calls carriers and emails carriers and inputs the information, we see a lot more of those roles evolving into areas like carrier relations, sustainability initiatives, uh, more involvement in the procurement topics. And again, a really big one we've been seeing lately is more focus on that network analysis component. Yeah. And the emphasis on sharing of data, both internally and externally, then the idea of the network is so important these days and automation is certainly helping to facilitate that. Bill, what do you think? Automa um, your automation and logistics. Yeah, it's just interesting. It's great minds think alike because, uh, I mean, both what Brendan and Paul said, it's kind of what I was thinking is, you know, and Paul said it, you know, we're always being asked, OK, what can I what can I automate from a transportation process so that I can, you know, again, really live by that management by exception, uh, you know, mantra, you know, so basically I don't have to do grunt work where it's, you know, basically it's a, you know, not even the email, but it's basically really simple. It's okay. I know how do I set it up where I basically as much as possible have stuff either go, you know, what we call zero click or touchless where nobody, you know, nobody goes through it or, okay, maybe that isn't the po possibility all the time, but okay. What about ex even automating exceptions? How do I manage the, you know, the handling exceptions. So even within the exceptions, there could be some, how can I look at them and maybe even use, you know, automation or use AI or machine learning or something like that to basically say of these exceptions, even within that, you know, hundred exceptions, we'll say 20 of them you could automate, you know, cause it's basically, you know, something that consistently happens or something like that. Um, whether it be a bad invoice or something like that, their transposed number or something like that, but it's basically, mm -hmm you know, how do I, how do I facilitate that process? And again, it goes back to m making day in the life easier for our end users, but then also, as Paul said, then making, you know, letting folks not focus on that grunt work, if you will, but on the value add things like the, the carrier relations, like the carrier, the, the lane analysis, um, you know, working with other parts of the organization, things like that. Yeah, and it sounds like automation and AI will increasingly take over handling some of those exceptions without the need for a human being to step in. Although, again, some of the big uh, big decisions still have to rest with the human, at least for 
foreseeable future. So, okay, guys, we're talking about a lot of a lot of things here, a lot of things we've experienced in logistics in the last few years, and it probably all kind of amounts to certain degrees of pain. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, what are the biggest pain points? Just kind of summing up this whole picture you guys have seen in the recent years and now, what are the biggest pain points that you see in logistics today? Paul? Yeah, so I think communication continues to be number one. I mean, uh, Brendan, you mentioned earlier that was that seemed to be one of the biggest benefits out of the implementation of TM over at Stemilt. But I, I think it continues to be a big driver, even, you know, e as pain points exist whenever I'm talking to customers, because it isn't just your carriers, it's communication with your carriers, your vendors, customers, and any other partner within the value stream. Um, even communication upstream and downstream within your own processes. So making sure your transportation team's talking to the warehouse, they're going to be talking to the yard, they're talking back to the planners, and everybody's clear when there's a delay. Um, so again, being able to share that real-time information is today a pain point, but it can turn into one of the biggest benefits that your business has. And that example that Bill brought up earlier with, hey, if we have visibility that there's a, a four-day delay on the ocean, well, instead of having to monitor this, we could leverage something like AI to automatically communicate that downstream to our on carriage or land carrier for that final leg to save you a phone call, to save you constant headaches of having to call them as it gets updated more and more. Um, so I, I think communication is still the area for biggest improvement. What do you think, uh, Brendan? Pain points. Yeah, I mean. As, as Paul said, communication is a big one. It's one of the one of the biggest things that I've seen as I've taken taken on this larger role within transportation. Um, it, it is the number one pain point we have between uh, Stemelt and our customers on, on the receiving end. Um, and then, you know, just leading into the other things that I see from from my standpoint is, you know, just the narrowing of lead time, as well as a shift to uh, more frequent, smaller shipments. Those are huge on us uh, from a transportation standpoint. Um, you know, customers are, are trying to keep their freshness up, and especially with a product such as Stemelts, where it's a perishable goods that's, you know, we can't just hold an inventory forever. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we have lead time available so that we get the, the you know, raw product into the right finished goods. And then, you know, being able to to build um, any smaller shipments, you know, you talk about less than truckload. Um, you know, we always prefer a full truckload if we can get it, but you know, we get a lot of those less than truckload shipments, and uh, you know, actually, uh, TM has helped us with that um, as well. I mean, it's it's we're putting everything into one one space where everything's visible, and I can see all of my LTL shipments that I have in the same place, and then you know, look at it from a, 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 a planning standpoint to say, can I, can I fit these together? Can I talk to my customer and say, um, can you take a, can you take a delivery a day earlier, a day later, um, just so that I can, you know, push all this stuff together so that I'm not having those multiple trucks on the road, um, you know, that are, that are maybe, um, you know, hopefully, you know, if you're, if you're shipping something, uh, via an LTL carrier, hopefully they're filling that truck out with something else, but you can never be too sure. Um, you know, you never want any empty space on a truck. That's just, you know, lost dollars for the, for the carrier. And it's, um, you know, just wasted space that is, you know, not being uh, utilized. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Bill, where are SAP's users hurting the most? Well, in, in, in terms of pain points, it's kind of interesting because you talk about I talked about the realities and things like that at the beginning. But in some ways, it, it's a conflict, at least what I'm seeing is a conflict of trying to keep things simple because everybody wants to keep things simple. But as the industry becomes more complex, you know, as as, as both Paul and, and Brendan have kind of touched on. You know, it's it, the, the smaller, you know, faster deliveries or it's, you know, uh, the sustainability initiatives, things like that. Um, so there's there's increasing demands on service, but there's also that constant pressure to keep costs down, both from, you know, internal uh, cost controls, but also from being on a, you know, 
uh, keep prices down for your customers. Okay. Um, but throw in there, you know, sustainability efforts, you know, short term, you know, we can, you know, we, we, we can talk about the consolidation. We can talk about better routing and scheduling uh, for folks that may not have been doing it or that well, folks that can, you know, still have room for improvement. Um, but what about the folks that are really far along on that, on that you know path on that maturity path, you know, then you got to throw in things like, you know, uh, sustainability, you know, and things like electric vehicles is one thing which we may talk about later. You know, folks want to, you know, there's pressure to use them for sustainability reasons, but there's cost impact for there. I mean, I was on a, a, a basically a, a conference last summer, the CSCMP conference, where that was one of the conversations folks were having. The carriers were talking with the shippers, basically saying, yeah, there's a need, there's a desire, but how do we manage that? You know, and it goes back to communication. How do we how do we share that? So those are just those are some of the pain points I'm seeing. The kind of big thank, picture. Yeah, thank you, thanks to all of you for those uh, those great answers. I want to bring the audience in now with their questions for our panel. We have some questions that have already come in, but even as we are answering these, audience members are encouraged to continue to submit your questions while we're addressing these others, and we'll get to as many as we can, time permitting. So uh, let me just uh, ask this first question coming in. It's a, kind of a general one. Uh, I'm going to pose it to all three of you. How do you collaborate with your carriers? Brendan? We collaborate with our carriers in many ways, you know, whether through email, phone, text, uh, just kind of depends on the relationship with the individual carrier and, and who our representative is. Uh, we work to foster those relationships on a daily basis. Our, our current bridge between SAPTM and and our carriers for, uh, you know, a um, load level uh, collaboration is is the WeLink carrier collaboration portal. Um, and then we're getting ready to actually make the jump over to the SAP logistics business network, which is going to give us greater collaboration power with our carriers and help us foster those relationships even further. And, uh, you know, being able to automate a lot more of those processes that we already have uh, to help save even more time. Paul, what's your opinion or your view on best practices right now for collaborating with carriers? Yeah, I mean, I, as I'm more on the implementation side, I'll maybe take a step back and share what I tell a lot of my customers, and it's bring them in early. Um, at whenever you're going through a digital transformation or, you know, even just upgrading your transportation management system or bringing them something that's going to change the way they do work, it benefits you so, so much just by bringing them in early, explaining what the change is going to be and getting them involved and bought in. Um, I think that's one of the best ways to collaborate with carriers and from the systems transformation standpoint. Certainly as capacity constrains and tightens as it does in kind of a seesaw sort of way, it's important to be that so-called shipper of choice when that is a good, uh, a good way to get a carrier on your side. Uh, to involve them in collaboration as opposed to just a transactional uh, relationship. Bill, what is your view on some good ways uh, that uh, cl carrier collaboration can happen today? Well, I mean, for us, you know, what we are uh, need to do is we need to make sure we provide the the multiple options for folks. Okay, um, you know, um, you know. I'm amazed still the number of folks that, you know, for, for, for some folks that, you know, uh, a collaboration portal is, is cutting edge technology. Um, but for, you know, and, and that's one way, but then there's also B2B. Uh, how do you, you know, communicate with uh, or collaborate with them? And B2B can be multiple things. It could be, you know, traditional EDI, um, which uh, I think everybody, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the forecast of EDI's death was uh, a little premature, I think, because I think it's going to be here for quite some time. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, but but then also being, you know, API, you know, that's one of the things where, you know, a lot of folks have said, let's go with API, um, you know, and it, it's it's kind of the you know, next gen, if you will. Um, but kind of what Paul said, bring those carriers in early to make sure they're aware of it um, so that they could potentially transition from, uh, the older EDI technology to the more flexible, newer API technology. Anybody else got a perspective? I guess uh, we pretty much covered the collaboration side of things. Okay, here's an audience question coming in. Uh, what has been your biggest failure you've had to date when it comes to implementing automation? And what have you learned from it? Don't worry, it won't get out to anybody. You, you can tell us. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, who wants to start with that? Uh, maybe I'll, we go. I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, okay. 
but you know one of one of our biggest failures is just you know uh making sure that you're doing things the right way and making sure that you follow through all processes from start to finish uh, you know one of the things that that um hurt us a little bit when we went live with SAP TM was just following through the processes all the way to the finish. Um, and, and part of that was just not having uh, enough time built in for the follow through. Um, you know, when you're working with transportation carriers, you know, you're, you're hiring a truck, you know, anywhere from, uh, you know, three to, to five days uh, before your shipment takes place, uh, trying to realize that expense. And then, you know, they're coming in to pick it up. It's delivering five to six days later. They're sending you an invoice five to six days after that. You're finally processing that invoice two to three weeks after after the initial um, transaction went live. And, and being able to follow through that process from start to finish, you, you need to have time to make sure that you're following it all the way and, and making sure that all of those processes are being considered and working properly uh, before you go live, you know, we, we, it, it took us a little while to catch up with that after we went live. So. Paul, where do you see Murphy's law coming in? Where have you seen failures in your experience that uh, kind of popped yeah. up? Unexpectedly? Yeah. So with, with automation, again, it, whatever tool you're using, you can typically automate anything, but sometimes it can become a feat of over-engineering. You can put too many parameters or guardrails in place and the time and effort to get something stood up just to automate it might be, you know, five minutes of time savings a week. So we try to push back on customers when they're asking for heavy, heavy, unnecessary automation for the 1% of processes. Um, but that that's typically where I see customers start to stumble is when it's trying to automate for the 1% scenarios. Great. Thank you. Bill, you're, you're, you're nodding. Is that pretty much your... Well, Perception yeah, I well. think of experiences also that, you know, that one building something, you know, for one, the 1% is something I, I, I yeah, I definitely can relate to here where you, that you, you need to really focus on the, the bigger percentages. The other ones I've seen are make sure, uh, and I think it probably kind of might be a, just a variation of what Paul said, but basically, yes, you may have had an idea for automation. It may be something you, you did in the past or you thought would be a good idea really evaluate it and what the impact would be because sometimes just like you know just because you you think it's a good idea look at the the longer term impact because i've seen folks automate things that ultimately cost them a lot of money um you know it, it, because it was something they thought they had to do um or and and i don't know if paul and, and brendan had this experience but uh you know as part of their initial project but i know back when i used to implement uh from an automation perspective getting those email alerts about you know uh, a late shipment or something like that, making sure you you really want to get, you know, the, you, you have that threshold set the right way. Because I remember folks saying they wanted to get an email for every single possible exception. And usually after, if you don't, and worst case was that they said, oh, I don't need to test it. You know, if, if they tested it, they would have realized, you know, their mail email box could potentially, you know, get filled up in, in a day because, you know, if you don't have those thresholds set right, you suddenly are getting exceptions for every little thing. Um, so those are just, you know, some of the examples. Yeah. The only person on earth who ever said, give me more emails. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Here's a, here's a good audience question. Uh, at my company, this questioner says, we are currently building and developing an internal application that sits on top of our core systems to be essentially the primary control for users. However, we are seeing the smarter we make the product, the dumber people get. In your opinion, what is the best way to combat that? Or is this just a byproduct of advancing technology in an organization? But Bill, why don't I start with you on that? Um, is that, that's, is that a, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's again, for me, that would go back to, and then you, you did say start with me, right? Yeah, I did. Uh -huh. okay, one minute. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I had to, I, I apologize for that, but go ahead. <laughs> problem um I, I just didn't, didn't want to jump on top of uh, uh, mm -hmm. paul's answer but um to me that's really you need to look at the design then and and try and figure out okay what are you trying to accomplish you know and i'm still fl floored by the um you know it's the smarter we make it the dumber you know uh, the the did you, was that the words yeah the smarter the smarter the product the dumber the people get 
Okay, so I want to make sure I wasn't misquoting, but um, I, I, a, I think is you know what's the issue, what's the design, um, and is it are you giving the folks access to the the decision making tool they need? You know, is it is it is it is that the situation where you're just pointing out the what was the commercial or basically I'm not solving the problem, I'm just letting you know there is a problem, uh, but you don't give them the tools to help make the right decision. Um, I mean, that's just, you know, it's a very intriguing question. Mm -hmm. Paul, you, you see that happening? Yeah, so I, I, I'd, I'd say there's three things. One would be look at the design. That, that's always what it boils down to. If the design and the bones are wrong, then that, that's where you have to start. The second thing is if, if it's a UI or a process change, that really boils down to change management and making sure that the team's being enabled on what the new processes are, what the exact path to follow is, and that they've been properly trained on it. And the third topic that always comes up with this is more around the automation component. If you're automating and making their lives easier, I would say that it, I don't want to say, you know, it, it makes them dumber, enables people to be dumber, but People naturally want to do meaningful work. So if, if they're able to branch out and go into an area that allows them to focus more on improving efficiencies or problem solving for, you know, what isn't automated, I'd say that's a route that we push customers to take. Thank you. Let's try to get a couple more questions in before we run out of time. Uh, the questioner says, what hidden KPIs, key performance indicators, do you consider most essential for measuring performance and effectiveness? Brendan, you got KPIs you're looking at? Well, yeah, I mean, KPIs always, in this question. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Kind of at, uh, we're always kind of looking at those KPIs and, and seeing um, what can we improve. And uh, some of the hidden ones we're, we're trying to look at is um, just efficiency. Um, you know, obviously that's not a huge hidden one, but there are there are hidden efficiencies, you know, that, that you try and look at. Um, and being able just to, I think, you know, the, the most hidden part in my world is being able to measure those uh, hidden KPIs effectively, um, whether it's, you know, on-time delivery percentage uh, or, uh, you know, which is a, a huge focus or, uh, you know, those, the miles driven, the best route, being able to uh, consolidate, uh, uh, you know, the, the routes planning and, and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we were talking about interacting. We were talking about sharing of information. We were talking about networking. Um, this question about how does your logistics team interact with other parts of your company? And I guess I would, again, start with Brendan on that one. Let's assume Sorry. that they do. How does your logistics team interact with other parts of your company? Uh, you know, we're a vid vertically integrated company. So, you know, every every different section interacts with every you know, different uh, department. Um, with transportation, you know, we're, we're extremely integrated with our sales team. Um, they need to know that we can perform properly. Uh, ultimately, they're the ones that are uh, responsible and uh, back to their back to their individual customers. And uh, we, we want to perform for them. Uh, we also need to know what they have going on in, in their own world so that we can do our best to try and forecast what our needs are going to be for transportation down the road. Um, you know, is it going to be a big crop? Is it going to be a small crop? How much are we selling to, uh, you know, New York versus Florida and what time of year is that going to come in so that we can try and forecast our best uh, to make sure that we're hiring the right carriers uh, for those, for those lanes at the right times of year. Yeah. Well, you know what? Unfortunately, I hate to say this, but we are just about out of time. Uh, we have a number of other questions, which I'm sure our panelists would be happy to answer offline. But uh, let's let's make time for one final question, which I'm going to direct to all members of the panel. And here it is. Based on your experience in digitizing and transforming your logistics processes, what advice do you have for others who wish to follow your lead and achieve similarly positive results? Brendan? Uh, the best advice I have for, for anybody looking at digital transformation is just to take your time. Make sure any solution that you are looking at fits your needs for your company and make sure whoever's building that system for you understands the needs that you put forth. Paul? 
Yeah. So for me, it all starts with change management at that executive level. Your leadership team needs to be visibly involved in the project and show some type of ownership, whether it's on the weekly, biweekly, or even monthly level. Bill, your advice. Yeah, I would say look at what you want to do going forward. Okay. Identify the areas where you want to, but also can improve. Um, don't just pave over the ox cart. Like I think we've talked about already. Don't just, just because you were doing it before doesn't mean you have to keep doing it, you know, going forward. Uh, and when you look forward, you, you try and look, you know, be somewhat bold. Um, look beyond current, uh, you know, limitations or current processes uh, so that you, you build, you know, build something that's quote unquote future proof. Um, that you can grow into um, or, you know, that gives you the flexibility, um, you know, as your organization, you know, may change or, or hopefully at least grow. So uh, give yourself that flexibility. I'm going to take away that great metaphor paved over ox cart is the epitome of uselessness. Thank you so much for that, Bill. Thanks to all of you uh, for a great presentation. Uh, Bill King, Paul Slodovnik, and Brendan Manderley. That was fantastic. Audience, thank you also for your attendance and your great questions. I want to draw your attention to, to some very valuable assets as a follow-up to our discussion today. Here are several uh, white papers from SAP, one on building speed into supply chain logistics, another on logistics in the intelligent enterprise, and another on supporting a resilient and sustainable, we talked about that today, supply chain with digital logistics technology. Also a very valuable and interesting case study involving Stemilt growers on transportation digitization. And then finally, a registration link to SAP Logistics Information Days 2023. Now, don't worry about getting access to those. The URLs for all of those links will be sent to all attendees at, uh, of this of this um, webinar. So thanks again for everybody's great participation. And everybody, have a great day. Thank you very much.